Good. So uh, I apologize for my talk being TBA in the program. Uh, now you see what I intended to talk about. And it's, uh, it's going to be deja vu for those of you who were here yesterday and saw Orly and, and Mauro talking about the physics and philosophy relationship. Uh, but I will say a few things that are different. And So I'm going to um, start out by talking about some of the difficult difficulties in the relationship between physicists and philosophers that have uh, flared up in the last few years um, with some quotes that uh, some of which we saw yesterday and, and others will be new to you. Um, and then what I want to do is uh, offer a, a partial diagnosis of why the relationship is difficult right now. I'm uh, especially thinking of theoretical physicists um, and philosophers of physics, but philosophy in general and physics uh, in general too. Um, and then say a few things about um, how we might be able to do things a little bit better in ways that improve the relationship. So that's, that's where we're going with this. Now, some fun quotes. Uh, as, <coughs> as you heard yesterday, um, there was a lovely uh, uh, interview by Hawking and uh, part of the things he said about philosophy include this. Um, he says, uh, there are these traditional big questions uh, for philosophy, but philosophy is dead. Philosophers Again, from a, an interview, and he's, he's uh, basically saying that uh, in the past, in the good old days, philosophers did contribute to the progress of science and, and physics. In the early 20th century, especially, um, uh, but the 1920s come in, we learn about the expanding universe in the same decade as we learn about quantum physics, each of which falls so far out of what you can deduce from your armchair that the whole community of philosophers that previously had added materially to the thinking of the physical scientists was rendered essentially obsolete. And at that point, I have yet to see a contribution. This will get me in trouble with all manner of philosophers. Call me later and correct me if you think I've missed somebody here. So nobody has contributed uh, to the progress in physics basically since the time of uh, Einstein and Heisenberg. So, um, but he laments it and he's, uh, he's saying it's a, it's a real shame because back in the old days, uh, uh, philosophical thinking helped. And then we have uh, a more extreme example, um, a physicist named Krauss, a theoretical physicist. Um, but what didn't come out in yesterday's discussion is that uh, um, the attack that you'll see here against uh, philosophers didn't come out of the blue. He was first uh, royally spanked in a, in a New York Times review of books, uh, uh, review by, by David Albert, a philosopher. Um, and he makes uh, this tired joke that uh, uh, philosophy is like the Woody Allen joke, those that can't do teach, and those that can't teach, teach Jim. Um, I'm not sure how we should translate that to philosophy. But uh, he says, the worst part of philosophy is the philosophy of science. The only people, as far as I can tell, that read works by philosophers of science are other philosophers of science. And that stings because it, it's 99% true. Um, it has no impact on physics whatsoever, and I doubt other philosophers read it because it's fairly technical. And so it's hard to understand what justifies it. That's that's Krauss. And uh, although, by and large, uh, philosophers, uh, in response to these attacks, uh, we clicked our tongue and, 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 and uh, said things amongst ourselves about what a shame it is these, philo these physicists don't understand. Um, of course, you can count on certain um, philosophers to go ahead and be outspoken in response. So here's a nice uh, uh, response. Of course, it was not always so with physicists, but the current generation 
at least those who try to speak to the broader public, does seem remarkably inept in logical and rational thought, and unembarrassed to display that to the world. Which raises the question, why? My best guess is that the culture so celebrates physics that physicists have come to believe the PR about themselves. That's uh, Brian Leiter, uh, a famous polemical uh, blogger in philosophy. So all of these things happened in the last uh, four or five years. Um, things have settled down and calmed down of late, and we can hope that, that this won't spark up again. But this is so far from the ideal of what, the, what I think the relationship be between physics and philosophy ought to be perceived to be like, um, that I want to remind us of, of what that ideal, um, which I think many here in the room share, uh, what that ideal was meant to be like. And so let's think about how philosophy should help physics. Um, well, we're supposed to be the masters of rigorous conceptual analysis and criticism, which from time to time can come in handy in, in talking about theoretical physics. Um, we have played roles uh, throughout history in opening up new metaphysical paradigms. Uh, we heard yesterday a lot about the mechanical philosophy that emerged in the, in the 17th century, and that was philosophy. Uh, we have developed new logical and mathematical tools, Descartes being a, a very notable example of that. And we have uh, helped to justify new scientific methods and bring them into practice. Of course, most of, of these things, the best examples I could give you, do come before the 20th century. But the ideal, the ideal is not uh, by any means dead. Uh, Carlo Rovelli is our hero, of course, uh, among uh, sort of well-known or famous contemporary theoretical physicists. He's a, a, a physicist of quantum gravity, but he talks so often to philosophers that he, you could call him a philosopher physicist at this point. And he did give a lovely lecture in LSE in July um, where he said, um, among many other good things, he said, quantum gravity demands us to rethink the notions of space, time, observer, causality, confirmation. And here physics is particularly in need of the clean conceptual analysis offered by the philosopher. So thank you, Carlo. Um, and I also stole this slide from uh, Rovelli's talk because I, I like it, this slide and another one. Um, here you see Carlo Rovelli's idea of where philosophers have had very important influences on the work of important sciences or scientists throughout history. And I think those of you familiar with the history of science will recognize every one of these arrows. It's, uh, <coughs> it's correct. Um, so, but the, the relationship is not meant to go just from philosophy being useful to science or to physics. It's supposed to go the other way, uh, and it does at times go the other way as well. So physics can help philosophy and has helped philosophy by opening up new categories for our understanding of nature, um, disproving things once thought a priori true. This guy did a lot of that. <coughs> Providing constraints for metaphysical and ontological theories that we want to propose today. Again, this guy is the best example of, of doing that uh, providing of new constraints that philosophers should respect when we, when we try to do ontology of, of the world. Um, so the arrows go in the opposite direction. Um, and again, all of these arrows that Rovelli has sketched here, I think, are, are quite appropriate. Um, Einstein, I guess this arrow goes to analytic philosophy. Um, but in general, all of these guys I don't think it's just quantum gravity, but all of these things together have to be taken into account and have their impact on doing good philosophy. So I, I subscribe to, uh, to Rovelli's view, optimistic view of this. But it has to be said that, again, the relationship is rocky and there haven't been that many great examples of the really fruitful interaction between the two camps, theoretical physics and, and philosophy of science or philosophy of physics, um, in the last 50 years. There have been some, but not, not that many. Now I want to get on to my diagnosis of why we're in this awkward situation. Um, does anybody recognize this dashing and handsome uh, young man? Hey, hey. Hegel. Hegel, that's right. Um, I, I just brought him in here for a phrase that I, that I like of Hegel's, which is the labor of the notion. So Hegel had this uh, dramatic uh, and huge view of what all of the uh, 
academic enterprises or the, the, the whole enterprise of human thought was after. It was the, the complete comprehension of what he called the notion, which is basically uh, the whole universe and everything uh, all wrapped up. Which is not a bad description of what philosophers um, should be striving to understand. And physicists are, are involved in at least a large part of that too. And the labor of the notion is coming to a complete understanding of everything from top to bottom. All right. Understanding material nature, the universe from top to bottom, that's a shared project between physicists and philosophers. Um, and the problem is we are extremely far from having this, this job finished. Hegel might not have agreed with that. Uh, he was overly optimistic about what he achieved in his own books. But, um, but we are still ex extremely far, in my opinion, from having finished this labor of the notion. And uh, just as Hegel was, was not uh, ready to recognize that in, in the 1800s, theoretical physicists in the 20th century were not ready to recognize that either. And so you had, um, you had enormous strides made by the, the advent of quantum theory and Einstein with his special and general relativity, enormous breakthroughs, incredible stuff, but there was this remaining project to be done of reconciling gravity and Einstein's theory with the quantum theories and coming up with a unified picture of nature. And all the smart theoretical physicists who knew they were damn smart in the, in the mid 20th century thought, okay, so Einstein's a little old now, he's not gonna finish the job, but I'm just as smart. And, and we're going to have this thing dusted and done in, 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 in a few years now. Um, so, sorry, I, I won't go over the, the things that happened in the 20th century. We all know how, how things got uh, very strange. Um, but the upshot of this, di this problem of quantum mechanics, uh, understanding it on its own, and then reconciling it with gravitation and space-time and relativity, has just remained this unsoluble and unsolved problem that the most brilliant theoretical physicists of the late 20th century and early 21st century have banged their head against. And all they do is break their heads. So we're in this awkward situation. A genius of Einstein's caliber is not sufficient to disentangle the mess. So it seems. We need someone even more brilliant. Good luck waiting for that to happen. Um, and so that's the problem. I, I, th I think that this really, really burns the theoretical physicists and it frustrates the philosophers too. We're, we're, we're stuck. Theoretical physics has not made a very important breakthrough since the early 1970s. At least not one that is experimentally proven. Perhaps a, a polemical statement, and it depends on what you mean by a major breakthrough. But I would stand by that, by that statement, and that's 40 something years now of being stuck, and, and that, that hurts. And I think that explains a lot of, of the tensions, quite honestly. Uh, everybody's frustrated with the situation and wishes that they could move things forward on both sides. Philosophers are frustrated that we haven't helped the, the physicists to push beyond the barriers in our understanding, and they, on the other hand, are frustrated that they haven't been able to do so. But even without, until as we're waiting for the next uh, supra Einstein to come along, we could do better. And I want to talk now about some things that philosophers have, have done in our, in our philosophy of physics that really don't help and that we could do better, and some things that physicists have done also. So here are some things that, that we philosophers of physics uh, do badly on, and this is, this is auto-criticism. I'm guilty of some of the things I'll be describing here. Um, not this particular one, I think, but, but there are others. Um, one of the things that philosophers do, uh, we, we play the game of coming up with new theories and new developments and new, new versions of old theories because that sells philosophy papers and it gets us tenure and so forth. That's the nature of our enterprise. So one of the things that, that philosophers of physics do is assume that there should be an X-ist interpretation of theory Y no matter what X and Y are. Multiplying the, the offered interpretations of physical theories to such an extent that to outsiders, don't play this game that philosophers play, in particular to physicists, it can easily start looking like we're just playing word games with each other. Here's an example. Um, philosophers who have worked from the assumption that there should exist a relationist interpretation of Newtonian gravity. Right. Right. Newton's gravity theory started out by saying, here's 
space. Here's time. They're absolute, and they're real. And of course, Leibniz disagreed. And Leibniz had the job of providing an alternative physics, which he failed to do. But then philosophers come along in the 20th century and decide, well, no, we should be able to take um, Newton's theory and come up with a way of being a relationist, that is, a, a not believing in absolute space and time, despite believing in Newton's gravity. No, you shouldn't be doing that, because in Newton's gravity, space and time are absolute and not relational, and that's the end of the story. And not, by not recognizing that, by not accepting these kind of things, and continuing to multiply interpretations, we just uh, we do no credit, I think, to our, ourselves and our discipline. Um, another thing philosophers do is impose antiquated language-based categories on our natural ontology. We continue on insisting on talking in terms of Aristotelian categories when, even when faced with theories like quantum theories, quantum field theories especially, where it seems pretty, pretty clear to those who dive into these things that those categories do not map on very easily to those new theories. And finally, another thing that we do as philosophers, unfortunately, is we hand wave away important distinctions um, in our effort to try to reestablish connections with older debates. So for example, the distinction between absolute space and absolute space time, or the distinction between absolute space and substantial space. So here's what I mean. Um, in classical Newtonian physics, uh, there was the doctrine of absolute or substantial space, and it was relatively clear what Newton meant when he talked about absolute space and, and posited it. Now, what happens with special relativity? No more absolute time, nor absolute frame of reference, no absolute rest. So absolute time is gone, absolute space is gone. And what did philosophers do? Well, we just tended to substitute the word space-time for space and pretend that nothing had really changed in the debate. Before you wanted to believe in absolute space, now you believe in absolute space-time and nothing has really changed. Well, no. Actually, things have changed in extremely important ways which we haven't discussed enough. The mode of existence of points or regions of space-time, if, if we can understand that at all, and I doubt it, is completely obscure compared to the mode of existence of um, a point or region of space that Newton talked about, which is there, and it's a thing, and it exists over time, just like other substances exist over time. But points and regions of space-time do not have duration. So if you talk about them existing at all, they do this funny thing. They pop into existence and then immediately out of existence. What kind of a substance is that? And I think you'll, you'll see that philosophers haven't talked that much about it. We just, we're lazy. And we just say, well, the, the same as being a substantivalist about space, I'm going to be a substantivalist about space-time. It's all clear, right? Well, I don't think it is. All right. Um, how, am I doing, how much time have I used? Five minutes left? So I should, I should accelerate. Um, uh, I, I will skip this other uh, example of, of philosophers being a bit lazy. Um, here, uh, philosophers have failed to, to clear up Mach's principle, and I'm guilty of that. Um, the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, um, what philosophers have done right is to keep on pestering physicists about it and keep rubbing their nose in the fact that there is a real problem here. Um, what we've done wrong, however, is insisting on allegedly producing new versions of quantum mechanics that do not violate non-locality non or non-separability and so forth. Instead of simply taking on, on board the lessons that we learned from Bell's theorem plus the experiments, which is that nature is non-local. Live with it. Um, so philosophers have insisted on offering abs really, in, in some cases, quite absurd new interpretations of quantum mechanics or quantum mechanics like formalisms, uh, David Albert's many minds theory, uh, various modal interpretations, and so forth. And, and again, if we attract the attention of physicists and they look at this, they'll just shake their heads and say, what are these people talking about? Um, and to be fair, though, many physicists have done exactly the same game. So it's not just us. Um, there is <coughs> Everett, <coughs> and there is uh, the Kramer transactional interpretation of quantum mechanics and so forth. All right, now, now let's turn the critical gaze to the physicists. What do they do badly about? Well, obviously, 
ignoring conceptual problems at the heart of, of physical theories, or even worse, pretending that they don't exist when they clearly do. Um, the key example here is the measurement problem, which many physicists in the 20th century went out of their way to deny was a real problem. Um, but also uh, real problems in our understanding of things like event horizons in general relativity, the missing mass in cosmology, and so forth. Um, physicists have failed to question and critically examine certain derivations and key uh, steps in, in arguments that have played <coughs> crucial roles in shaping current theoretical understanding of things. Um, and, and, and some of these things deeply cry out for being questioned, like the alleged problem of the frozen dynamics in Hamiltonian general relativity and, and canonical quantum gravity. Or the whole business of black hole thermodynamics that Hawking kicked off, gauge arguments which supposedly uh, allow us to predict particles out of, uh, out of nothing but simple symmetry con considerations and so forth. I think that we have examples here. Uh, it would take a lot of work to try to convince you of this, but I think we have examples here where physicists have not been um, sufficiently critical of each other in the 20th century and simply took on board what enormously powerful and influential and obviously brilliant theoretical physicists have asserted is obviously true. Now, few philosophers have the mathematical ability or the cultural clout necessary to start really call out, calling out the physicists on these things. And that's, and that's one of the problems why we can't uh, easily contribute to helping here. So, so these, these things tend to pass from one generation to the next, whereas philosophers are constantly criticizing each other and basically saying, you know, what all these philosophers said before, that's rubbish. That's not at all the culture in the sciences, of course. The sciences like to have a kind of a cumulative perception of their field. And, and so physicists like, don't like to just go back and say, you know, I'm going to question everything that Einstein thought about or everything that, um, that Heisenberg said about quantum mechanics. I'm going to go back and start from scratch there. It just doesn't happen. So um, physicists need to think critically and philosophically about conceptual foundations. And they need to do so not late in life, which is the habit, um, but as they learn physics. That's the time when the minds are young and flexible. Philosophers of physics need to leave behind the traditional positions, categories, and games that sell well in philosophy journals and write our, and we need to start writing more of our papers as though we expect half of the audience to be physicists. Right now we write our papers knowing that none of our audience or, or, or very, very, very few will ever be physicists. Right? And I think that that encourages us to play games that, that we really shouldn't play. So I'll wrap up by saying a few things how we can improve the situation. Um, and these are pie in the sky, uh, idle, idle dreams, because none of us in this room has the power to enforce these things. I just want to assert that these would be good if we could, if we could implement them. Educational changes, I, I believe strongly that all physics majors should take first a course in general philosophy of science and then a course in philosophy of physics as part of their undergraduate training. I believe philosophers of physics should, um, as a cultural requirement, if not actually written into the, the degree requirements, always do at least a master's of science in physics or equivalent. And if possible, they should join a physics group and, and get experience working with the scientists and talking to them. And when I was the director of the Rotman Institute, I started to see the benefits of that kind of uh, immersion of, of philosophers into scientific groups. And I think it could work in physics as well, although it is more difficult than in, in something like neuroscience. And there should be other measures to increase the contact and mixing between the two disciplines. Um, one thing that can help, and I think that uh, we, can, we may be able to do things along these lines, is to have more interdisciplinary research projects that tackle key conceptual puzzles or controversial and obscure areas of physical theory. Um, an example of one that just started um, which I have been invited to, to be a very minor visitor or participant in, is um, a Templeton-funded uh, black hole initiative that just started at Harvard. Um, it's really mostly uh, physicists, but they brought in some people from the arts and, and, uh, and Peter Gallison from philosophy, and they do have the intention of bringing in, in uh, philosophy students and, and professors to visit. Um, Stathis' uh, ERC project, if it pans out, will be hiring um, at least postdocs who have training in, in, in physics and, and perhaps biology. Um, 
How about us? The pond network that we're trying to kick off in this conference, I think that in our future meetings, we should always invite one or two philosophy-friendly scientists to each of our future events as, as keynote speakers. Little things we can do, the big educational changes we can't implement, but at least we can, we can talk more about what's keeping the barriers up between our communities, what's preventing progress in theoretical physics, and what we can do to overcome it. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm the first one, <laughs> second time. Uh, <clears throat> well, thanks, Carl. Uh, in many of the things that you've said, I, I tend to agree, both the criticism uh, of the physicists' uh, attitude and, uh, and, and the philosophers, but I think that you were I mean, there may be some disagreements about you know, particular issues and so on. Uh, <clears throat> I think that I in a way, yeah, of course, in philosophy, especially in, I mean, I, I guess w we would agree on that. You hinted about that. Uh, discussions in pure metaphysics and so on, maybe they don't contribute to the sciences, especially if they overlook uh, development and progress in science and so on. The stuff you s you've said about the measurement problem, I think, is almost all of it is mistaken. So let me, let me try to uh, very shortly explain and then see your reaction. I think that the measurement problem is, is, is in a way unique in, in, in in, in the window it opened for philosophers. And actually, I think that also it is unique in, in another matter, uh, in another respect, namely that physicists ought to uh, uh, observe uh, much earlier than, than they did that there is a big problem in the main, the most fundamental theory of physics of our times. And they didn't do that, and it was very. Uh, it, it was. It, it was. Uh, in a way, it was. It. I think. It, it might even be. You know. It's not. It's not the same. I mean, we're not in the same situation that we were. Let's say, um, twenty. Even twenty years ago, just twenty years ago, uh, and that's largely thanks to work works of philosophers. So I think that, I mean, and, and now, of course, there could be, there could be uh, different uh, opinions or ways of looking at, you know, perhaps some, some attempts are uns were unsuccessful and so on, even, even with respect to the Everett interpretation, which, which we, Everett was a physicist, but nonetheless. So, the, you know, you may disagree about, about the virtues or or whether a, a certain response, a certain, a certain strategy, a certain thinking was unsuccessful, and so on. But I think that there are major, I mean, the measurement problem is not a technical problem in, in, in quantum mechanics. It is, it, it, it contains, uh, contains so many aspects of how to understand physics. Uh, for example, what one could, could construe the measurement problem as a problem uh, concerning the, uh, this is something that, that's related to, to Orly uh, uh, and mine works, um, as a problem concerning the, the physical nature of, of standard quantum mechanics, where it does, where the measurement problem came up. So there are, so I think that with respect to the measurement problem, but I'm not, you, I'm not hearing you got anything that, anything that contradicts what I was trying to say. So I, I don't see what you. Well, I mean, you mentioned, for example, the many minds interpretation as, as, a, as a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing because the many minds interpretation, for example, was an attempt, I mean, I'm not talking about modal interpretations because maybe I'm too close to that, but many minds interpretations uh, of, of, uh, 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 due to David uh, Albert and, and Barry Lower, 
I think what they wanted to show was extremely important and is still important today about the measurement problem in quantum mechanics and specifically about the Everett interpretation. What they wanted to show is that there is a way to make sense of Everett. And, and they thought that it's sort of a natural way of going through that. It's not Everett, but, without, but if you go that way, and, and actually my own thinking is that is that this is, this is really important because if you go that way, and many, many, many physicists who, I mean, you know, the Everett interpretation is quite central among physicists who think about foundations of quantum mechanics. They thought that if you go that way and you don't pay enough attention to the foundations, you're, 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 you're going towards an explicit dualistic uh, theory in physics. That's, and and they, they brought it up, and they, you know, so I think it is important, as I said. Even if you, if you think that the theory is, in a sense, silly, which I think that they also don't take it seriously, but, but it, they had a point to make. One, yeah, you, you may be right. I, I, would, I would need to talk to people about uh, the reception of those papers and, and what kind of impact they had. Uh, if it was meant sort of as an ironic or kind of a, a, a acute uh, reductio ad absurdum that we could to, to draw attention of physicists to a certain problem, maybe it was uh, successful. Um, sure. Um, well, one question, and then I'd like to have some sort of, uh, well, it's, and then the comment, I would say. What about cosmology? I agree with you that in quantum field, uh, field. Uh, people are just doing normal science. So no major breakthrough uh, in the last 50 years. But maybe in the cosmological field, we discovered, I mean, they discovered so many new things like uh, the missing mass, dark energy, dark matter. And maybe we should expect a lot of new data from that. Uh, and, and then the second question is uh, just relating uh, what uh, to what just uh, um, Mayer has been said. I think the problem with uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics is that they don't provide any new prediction. So this is really what we want the me the, so the solution of the quantum uh, me measurement problem to be. I mean, physicists respect Bell's work a lot because Bell just provided a new way of testing, uh, for instance, the problem of non-locality. But all these interpretation of quantum mechanics, like Bohm is an example. I mean, they explain the measurement problem, but they don't come up with any new prediction. And that's not a good thing for physics. I mean, Newton came up with a theory that could predict, for instance, why the Earth uh, is. No. But, um, but, but, so I, I would disagree with you about what Bell did, uh, meaning no disrespect to Bell. All he did was uh, happen to notice a very clear and, and important consequence of the quantum formalism, which is always there. It's not a new prediction in any way at all. Um, and, and sort of rub our noses in the fact that uh, it implied non-locality unless you're willing to swallow really absurd things like conspiratorial initial conditions and so forth. And so, and so um, I, I, of course, in the, if we eventually come to a widely accepted resolution of the measurement problem, it may happen um, in the context of a new theory which has new predictions to offer. That would be the ideal, and that's what I expect also. But it can't be, I don't think it can be a, a condition that we impose on, on good work in the, in the foundations, because Bell's work was excellent, but he didn't give any new predictions. Um, let me come back to cosmology. Um, I think it's too early to judge whether the last 30 years of cosmology and the, 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 the dark matter and the dark energy and so on, um, whether 100 years from now we will look back on this as uh, a period of deep, deep confusion and, and absurd decisions or as the beginning of the un unraveling of the true structure of the universe. It's too early to tell in my view, but, but I'm very suspicious as a a philosopher who's looked at some of the history of science, at the way these things are simply brought in, not because of sort of direct evidence for their existence, but because 
in order for general relativity's equations to work, there has to be this, these extra terms. And that's uh, at least it's, it's a cautionary, off. it's a caution flag for me. Um, thanks for the talk. So I wanted to make a comment in the other direction. In your, uh, in your um, uh, program, in your uh, 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 initiative to uh, uh, improve the re relationships between physics and philosophy, you recommended more physics for philosophers and more philosophy for physicists. I want to make, uh, I hope not to sound too, too provocative about this, but I would recommend more philosophy for philosophers of uh, science and philosophers of physics, because I think one of the main problems, and I, I'm leaving aside for the moment discussions in the foundations of, uh, of quantum mechanics, which I don't know, it's a mess and things have somehow gone wrong between philosophers and physicists, physicists on that, uh, in that field. But there are other places where physics and philosophy kind of seem to or science and philosophy seem to come together. And I think the problem there on our side is that philosophers come to these discussions um, with a certain, haven't already kind of bought into a philosophical story which has been fed to them by, by, by scientists and not equipped well enough with the kind of uh, 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 philosophical either tools, background, or whatever needed in order to uh, um, engage in, in more profound discussions about them. One of them was mentioned yesterday between us. I think in the philosophy of time, there's been so much discussion about physics, and much of it, to my mind, utterly misguided. And it's kind of gotten worse in last years, and I mentioned uh, uh, yesterday Smolin's book as, as an example of that. Um, Smolin is a physicist, but you find many philosophers doing the same kind of work. And discussing time, having already accepted Einstein's paradigm uh, uh, on this, and just to mention, there was a, a, a talk given here some years ago but by, by, by Jimena Canales. I often mention this book. It's a book, it's a recent book, came out recently about the relationship between Einstein and Bergson. This seems to be a discussion that most philosophers of science are completely ignorant of and, and know nothing about. Extremely relevant to the philosophy of, 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 of physics insofar as time is concerned. Uh, another, another domain in which I think philosophers come ill-equipped to the discussions with scientists is, is the philosophy of perception. Again, there's a certain paradigm that, that scientists, neuroscientists, psychologists, and so on are working in. It's not challenged by philosophers. They, philosophers accept this paradigm and kind of see their work as having trying to give some conceptual aid to, to, to the scientific work done there, where the serious philosophical questions are ancient, are, see, are, are profound and are not discussed, I think, when, when these kind of uh, meetings uh, take place. So what I would recommend to, uh, as an addition to your, to your program, not as a substitute, though it may change its uh, direction a little bit, is more philosophy for, for the philosophers of science. I, I don't disagree with, uh, with the, I'll take that as a friendly amendment or addition because um, uh, so here we are in the, in the in the pond and talking about a European and Mediterranean initiative, and I, I'm kind of noticeable for my accent among all the speakers. And um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be uh, nationalistic and say I think this is one thing that America and universities do better than European in general, is that uh, philosophy PhDs do all, all much better training in general philosophy than is typically the case in Europe because you specialize way too early. Um, and, and so American PhD programs tend to have much more by way of broad course requirements in philosophy. And I, I, I feel I was privileged to have that kind of training. And I, I don't disagree with uh, the I ideal that you're talking about. Status? Uh, well, that's the third talk uh, in this little conference on the relationship between physics and, and all science and philosophy. And honestly, I don't share the, the the anxiety, and and I don't feel that philosophy is it's got its own domain of discourse, its, its own methods, its own subject matter. Uh, the subject matter is science in the case of the philosophy of science, but it doesn't have to be relevant to the scientists. It's got to be relevant to science. And I don't care much whether I'm cited by scientists or not, or whether my impact, my work has an impact on on scientists because they don't share my worries about. And, and, and I want to say the following. 
I, I, I perceived, although your talk was excellent, I perceived the tension in the talk, which is the tension of the problem, it seems to me. It, it's the tension between what shall we be doing vis-a-vis -vis science. We should try to understand the current scientific image. So by, by that, and the, uh, we shouldn't question it uh, as it were. We should take it for granted and try to understand it what, it, what it implies about the world. Uh, but at the same time, we should try to criticize it, to go beyond it, to unravel problems and tensions that are uh, in it. And the tension was when you said that we shouldn't question non-locality. We shouldn't question absolute space and time in Newton. But it's as if that's a settled issue. Now that's what science tells us about the world. We take it for granted that we move on. Sorry, uh, let me, if you don't mind, um, what, is, uh, what I think should be settled and taken for granted is that Newton's theory brings in absolute space and absolute time, um, which is just a fact about the, the only way to understand the ontology compatible with his physics, not about the world. And of course, what, what we believe now is that the, it's not a true theory about the world, so what, what to believe about, about the world is open. I would also say that um, I, I, I view uh, the scientific image of the world that we get from contemporary physics as providing some constraints that we should respect, but by no means providing an image that we have to take for granted and not question. That, that's what philosophers of physics are, uh, largely are about, is questioning whether we get a coherent scientific image of the world out of contemporary physics. Uh, c can I offer a diagnosis very quickly? Be be why We're again running out of time. Is that fine? Yeah, just, yeah, um, it's it's going to be 30, 30, 30 seconds yeah, yeah, yeah. just to finish mm -hmm. off the point. So g g given this idea that we should at one, you know, take for granted the scientific image and try to understand it, and at the same, at the same time criticize it and go beyond it to find unravel difficulties and conceptual problems with it. It's obvious that what we should be doing it, it, it will not go well down well with what physicists do, because physicists think that the scientific image is okay as it is, there are no problems, or if there are problems, they will find them out. They, they don't need philosophers to do this kind of job. Fortunately, and, and that's not something that happened in, in, in the 17th century, in the 19th century. It's kind of a thing that got worse in the 20th century, especially lately. I, I think, well, there, there's some uh, truth to that, obviously, but actually the, the two camps of uh, uh, string, broadly speaking, string theory and, and loop quantum gravity, they hate each other with the, the flaming passion of 10,000 suns. And, they, and they, so there is no uh, scientific image there that they all agree on. And, and, um, uh, things are wide open. But they, they, they want to sort it out by themselves, not by the help of philosophers. Except for Rovelli. Yeah. <laughs> Our hero. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, there were several people who wanted to continue, but we have to stop. Yeah. Sorry. First question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Thank you.